Thanks, Ian. Morning, everybody. My name's uh, Sam. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege to try and explain that part of God's Word and apply it to our lives this morning. It's, uh, it's a really cold morning, isn't it? And uh, it's pretty hard to get out of bed when my alarm went at 6.20 this morning. I thought, oh. <laughs> Reminded me of a story of uh, this guy who was uh, it was a Sunday morning in bed, and uh, his mother came in and shook him and said, you've got to get up got to go to church and he pulled the blankets higher over his head and he said give me three good reasons and he said well God wants you to go and meet with his people and you'll meet your friends there and the third reason is you're the pastor (laughs) I I wonder what it is that got you to church this morning what drove you what drew you or drove you to come to church this morning uh, was it that there just what just wasn't a better offer this morning? Too cold to sit in the cafe? Or maybe just habit, you know, that's what we do on Sunday mornings. Um, maybe duty, you know, God says you've got to go to church, you've got to don't forsake the meeting together of God's people. What is it that drives us? We could broaden this question out, couldn't we? What is it actually that drives us to do anything? It's a really important question. It's a very important question uh, for Jesus, uh, which he addresses in this passage. And he makes it really, really clear what it is that drives him and what it is that he wants to drive his followers, what he wants uh, the motive for all that we do to be. So we'll get to that. Um, We're looking at Mark's Gospel, of course, and uh, we're answering the question, who is Jesus? And today our title is The King Who Turns the Tables. He does that literally in the temple, uh, but he also does it religiously. He's, he wants to turn these people's idea of what it means to, to know God on its head because they were doing stuff for the wrong reasons and in some cases they were doing the wrong stuff. They were doing the wrong things, thinking they were serving God but actually not. Um, last week, we're going to look at this in under three headings, uh, which, is, which, which you'll see on your outline on the back of the uh, news sheet if you want to follow it there. Um, firstly, he turns the tables in his temple. Now, I'm not just talking about the, the, the money changers tables, but uh, in the kind of religion that was happening there, he turns the whole thing on its head. He turns the tables on honouring God. What does it mean to actually honour God and do what God wants us to do? And on religion, Uh, and particularly he attacks the kind of religion that was around at the time. Uh, So firstly, in his temple. Last week we saw that Jesus and his followers were on their way to Jerusalem. And in in chapter 10, verse 32, that's up there, you'll see that Jesus is striding out in front of his followers and they're sort of amazed because he's already told them he's going to die there, he's going to be arrested and killed. And they think, okay, he seems to be going for it. And they're sort of following along, frightened, Mark tells us. But Jesus deliberately, purposefully strides out towards Jerusalem because it's there that he's going to give his life a ransom for many, which he's also told us in the previous chapter. That's why he came. This is the whole purpose of his mission on earth. And so he walks towards it deliberately. And now they're getting close. Uh, The king is coming to his city. The Lord is coming to his temple. The Messiah, the anointed one, is coming to give his life as a ransom. So Jesus uh, sends two of his disciples to go and get transport. And not the big white charger or the stretch limo, but a baby donkey. A little baby donkey that probably could hardly bear his weight. Now, why? A donkey that's never been ridden before. Why? Well, it's, it so happens that these very, very specific instructions are, are there to show what, who Jesus is and why he is coming. It's just as God has planned. And it looks like the whole thing is sort of set up because Jesus sends his disciples in to get a donkey and he, he tells them they'll find it there, they find it. 
Uh, the people say, what are you doing? And Jesus has already given them the answer. They untie the donkey and they bring it to Jesus. Way back a couple of thousand years before this, in Genesis chapter 49, when old Jacob is about to die and he's giving a blessing to each of his sons. And when he comes to Judah, part of what he says is this to his son Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to a vine and his donkey, donkey's colt to the choice vine. Amazing, isn't it? Way back then, Jacob, as he lays his hands on his son Judah, says this prophecy. And of course, the vine is a figure of the nation Israel. It's used over and over again uh, as a, as a, a um, metaphor for the nation of Israel. And Jesus is riding in on a donkey as the king of this nation. Um, a few hundred years later, about a thousand, fifteen hundred years later, Zechariah sharpens this prophecy in Zechariah 9 9, which Lou read to us uh, at the beginning of the service. Behold, uh, shout aloud, O daughters of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. So as Jesus comes into that city on that donkey, this very, very deliberate proclamation that I am the king. And I bring salvation. In fact, I am salvation. It is very, very clear. And the people respond. Uh, they put out, they, they, they spread out their clothes on the on the path and they bring palm branches they do what people do when they welcome a king at that time and they yell out Hosanna which means salvation he saves he's the saviour they recognising that he's their rescuer their saviour they don't know how it's going to unfold in the next few days and this one that they welcome is going to be put to death as a criminal on a cross but prophetically they yell out he saves, he saves, Hosanna, and welcome him. So Jesus comes into the city like that, and, but he comes to a specific place in the city at the end of that passage in verse 11. Jesus goes straight to the temple and he looks around. Uh, but because it's late, he goes back uh, to Bethany. So the Saviour King arrives uh, the second thing under this in, in the temple, we see the end of fruitless, exclusive religion. Jesus comes in the next day and uh, breakfast time, he's hungry. He goes to a fig tree, it's got leaves on it and he looks for fruit and there's no fruit. And Mark tells us it's not the season for figs. Uh, but uh, we went to our expert on fig trees, Pastor Lau, who's got one in his backyard. We said, Pastor Lau, what's this about? He said, ah, oh, before the leaves come on the fig tree, the, the, the little bud of the knop of the fruit comes on the fig tree. So even before the leaves come, he says, a very unusual tree. Even before the leaves come, you know whether or not there's going to be fruit. And Jesus comes to this tree, he's got beautiful leaves on it, but he looks, there's no fruit on it. And so he curses the fig tree and he says, may you never bear fruit again. Now it's very interesting that what Jesus does here, this, this cursing of the fig tree and the results of it, they come the next day and they, and they see that it's totally withered and, and from the top down to the roots. The whole thing's withered and died and gone. Mark splits this account and in the middle he puts the clearing of the temple. And he's, he's clearly saying that this fruitless religion that's going on in this temple, it's going to come to an end. It's got to come to an end because it's, it's not bearing any fruit and it's shutting out people who need salvation. And we'll get to that in a moment. So the clearing of the temple, let me give you a bit of a background here. Um, people came from all over the, the known world at the time, Jews who had been dispersed to, right throughout the Roman Empire. We know from Acts 2 they came from as far away as Rome, Turkey, uh, down into North Africa. They came to the temple to, to, to make sacrifices and to pay the temple tax. 
Now, you can imagine what it would be like lugging a sacrificial lamb on your shoulder all the way from Rome uh, to, to uh, Israel or from the other side of Turkey, uh, Cappadocia and those kind of places. So <clears throat> the enterprising Jews had thought, right, we'll set up a market here and we will sell these people, the sacrificial animals, the birds and all that stuff, and the temple tax. Captive market, so to speak. You know, it's like going to the post office to renew your passport and you need a photo. And you've forgotten to go and get the eight buck one from Kmart and you and, and the you, you end up buying the seventeen dollar one from the post office, you know, because you're there and you don't want to muck around. You know, it's all it's all set up to relieve you of your money. Uh, and and that's what the that's what the temple was like. Uh, it was also because you don't want to cart your sacrificial lamb all the way from the backside of Turkey to uh, to the temple and have the priest reject it and say, well, there's a blemish here. You're just meant to be without blemish, you know. Why don't you buy one of our unblemished ones at, 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 at the exorbitant rate? And, and of course, you couldn't buy these things with your own money. Uh, you had to change money into the temple money, especially to pay the temple tax. It could only be paid uh, in, with Jewish money. And so, of course, they had to exchange this Turkish lira or whatever it was, and, and people came and, and they would exchange. And of course, like the airport, you know, you're a captive audience again. You know what the exchange rates are like in airports? Uh, and you, you've got no choice. And then you go into the city and you find out you've been ripped off again. Um, <clears throat> this is what was happening here. They just charged whatever they wanted. Because they're the only people who had this temple tax money. <laughs> and Jesus was so angry. He says, you've turned... My father's house, a place of worship, into a den of robbers. You're sitting here ripping people off. And you're putting up signs saying, get out all you non-Jews. We don't want your filthy money. We don't want you, 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 you. It was all set up to keep out the non-Jew. And uh, if you see the next slide there, the, the archaeologists have dug up signs of, that, that were put on the balustrade of the, of the temple telling non-Jews to keep out. In fact, the translation there, in case you can't read it, says no foreigners to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death that will follow. So the worst part of this is God had chosen these people to be his own people, to be a blessing to the nations, and here they are shutting the nations out from connection with God. And Jesus is rightly angry. Not only are they trespassing on his father's house and ripping people off, but they put signs up saying, this is our turf, keep out. When they were meant to be doing the opposite. And Jesus gives notice that this fruitless, exclusive system is finished. That's the meaning of the cursing of the fig tree and its withering. Jesus giving notice, guys, this is over. And that's why he clears them out of the temple. It must have been an amazing sight, wouldn't it? Coins rolling everywhere, birds flapping and cows bellowing and sheep going berserk. But Jesus wants to make a very graphic image, a very graphic picture. Guys, you have got this totally wrong. In in the place of this fruitless, exclusive religion, uh, after the, the withering of the fig tree, Jesus talks about uh, the, the relationship of trust, that uh, the vital relationship of trust in God, that is true religion, true relationship with God, uh, where his followers trust him implicitly and their faith is rewarded. Uh, there's no boundary on this. Jesus says, you can say to this mountain, get up and be moved, go and jump into the sea and it'll happen. Of course, he's using hyperbole here. He doesn't want us to run around dumping mountains in seas. He's saying, guys, the limit of God's power, his power is unlimited. And we need to trust him. We need to live in a relationship of trust with him. And I think he's saying to those disciples as well, God can raise up something out of this, the ashes of this dead religion. This just doing it for the sake of doing it or doing it for the sake of profit. Jesus saying to those disciples who are going to go out and preach this message, right? Against all the odds. I think Jesus is saying, God can do it. He's powerful. Trust him. And he goes on to say, talk about forgiveness. When you pray, 
Uh, make sure that you're forgiven it. And God will forgive you. That's the biggest of all mountains, isn't it? For sinners like you and me to be forgiven by a holy God. And for us to forgive others. And what Jesus is saying is, guys, this is what it's about. Living in that relationship with God where we're honest about who we are. And God forgives us. And God, through us, extends his forgiveness to others. Ask him and he'll do it, Jesus says. In verses 27 to 33, there's a challenge to Jesus, a trap. And this is the first of seven uh, in this passage. By what authority are you doing these things, Jesus is asked, by the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. They're representatives of the three groups in the Sanhedrin, if you like, the Labor Party, the Liberal Party, the Greens, in the government. They all came to Jesus together and said, by what authority are you doing these things? It's a challenge to his authority. Jesus, of course, has been telling everyone for his whole ministry by whose authority he's doing these things. This has come up right through so far, hasn't it, in Mark's Gospel. It's very clear, Jesus is the Son of God. He's doing it by God's power, by God's authority. Nobody else can do these things but by the power of God, we're told, over and over again. Jesus knows what they're up to, so he says, tell me. Uh, If you answer my question, I'll answer yours. John's baptism, was it from God or from man? Now, there's a really key question. Because you know what happened when John baptised Jesus? God spoke from heaven and what did he say? This is my son. Okay, This is my beloved son. So these guys are well and truly caught. They know that all the crowd believe that John was a prophet. And, uh, and yet they know if, if, if they say, well, yeah, it was, was from God, Jesus said, well, why don't you believe it? Why don't you believe that? I have authority from God as God's son to do whatever I'm doing because that's what happened at Jesus' baptism. And so they pike out, they're gutless. They say, oh, we don't know. And Jesus says, okay, then I won't answer your question either. Uh, But he does go on to answer it. Uh, The problem for these guys is, uh, not that Jesus hasn't been clear, by the way, uh, in the past. The, The problem is they just don't believe That's the problem. Jesus has been abundantly clear about where his authority comes from. So the second thing that he turns turns the tables on is on honouring God uh, in chapter 12, verses 1 to 17. And firstly, the peril of rejecting Jesus. Jesus gives this wonderful parable. Actually, it's, it's probably the most important parable in Mark's gospel because it outlines history so far. You know the parable of the vineyard, there's a man who planted a vineyard and he set it up really nicely and he let tenants into it and so on. Really what this is about is that Jesus is saying God made the world, he made everything, he made you, he set it up for you to enjoy and particularly for the Jews, he gave them a land, uh, he gave them a, a national code to work within the framework of it, he gave them his love, he gave them his grace and mercy when they sinned. He gave them everything. Uh, but they said, no, we don't. We, they, when, it, when it came time to, to give, give some of the fruit, not all the fruit, some of it, <laughs> uh, to the owner, uh, they beat up the messenger. And, some of the, and, and the owner kept sending messengers whenever the, whenever the uh, harvest happened. And, uh, and they, they beat them, they killed them and so on. And finally, the owner says, I will send my beloved son, they will listen to him. Of course, in Jewish history, way back, he told them he's going to do that. He's going to send a saviour. He's going to send a messiah. And they say, wow. They see him coming. They say, right, we'll kill him. And then this whole shebang will be ours. It's very, very clear what Jesus is saying. He's saying, guys, the answer to your question is, I am the Son of God and I have come to call you to account for the way you're treating God. And I've come to open up the way for that to be fixed. And of course, these guys are thinking, we get rid of Jesus, we get him out of the way, he'll stop bothering us and and we'll have our little kingdom. And Jesus is saying, guys, you need to be 
You need to understand this. This is not the scenario. Shall not the owner of the vineyard come and give that vineyard to somebody else? He'll toss those tenants out and he'll give it to somebody else. He is clearly saying, you have made a mess of this and God is going to hand this over to somebody else. It couldn't be clearer and they get it. At least they get the fact that this story is told against them. Uh, But they leave off arresting him for the time being because they fear the people. That job will have to be done a few days later in the dead of night, out of public gaze. The next challenge, the next trap is uh, a joint operation. It's between the Pharisees and the Herodians, the religious and the Roman leaders. It's about tax. And so they bring the tax man along to hear the answer, right? (laughs) So this is not some idle question. Uh, They have brought the tax man along with his tax rulings to listen very carefully to the answer that Jesus is going to give. And this tax man is not just a tax man, he is an executioner. Because if Jesus gives the wrong answer, he will be put to death. As people before had been put to death. This was a hot issue uh, for the Jews. The Romans had come and taken over their country and had imposed taxes. And some zealous Jews had said, don't pay it. Don't pay it. The Romans had rounded them up and killed them and continued to do it. It's a death trap for Jesus. Uh, Jesus' answer is brilliant, isn't it? He says, bring me a coin. It's interesting, actually, that he didn't have one. (laughs) He said, bring a coin. And uh, whose insignia is on this? Whose image is on this? Well, Caesar's. He said, all right. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And actually here, actually, Jesus lays the foundation for his followers' relationship with secular authorities and with God and how that plays out. And the, of course, it's, it's described in more detail in, in, the, in the New Testament letters and in the book of Acts. There are things that the government has a right to ask for. We're heading up to an election. If you're... An Australian citizen, one of the things that the government expects us to be doing is really understanding the issues and voting with a clear head in a prayerful way uh, because that's the system he set up. That's that's one of our responsibilities. Uh, Another of our responsibilities, obvious from here, is to pay our taxes, pay our fair share of them. That's our responsibility as citizens of this country. Render to Caesar what's Caesar's and render to God what is God's. And they're amazed, actually, they marvel at him. I think they're probably also thinking, boy, he squirmed out of that one, hasn't he? The next uh, thing in, in verses 18 to 44 is Jesus turning the tables on religion. The results of not go- knowing God's word or God's power. The Sadducees, who are one of the factions in the, in the um, Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews, and also they had uh, control of the temple, and they were very strict law keepers. And they actually only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. So they didn't believe in the history books, the prophets, the wisdom literature. They said, we, we just, it's the law that's important, forget the rest. And... Uh, As a result of that, they were, of course, very focused on rules and regulations. But they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe that people would rise from the dead. You're dead, you're dead, that's it, the end of it. And so they actually asked this absurd question because they're trying to make fun of people who do believe in resurrection. And, of course, they're trying to suss out what Jesus believes in it. And so they they posed the question about seven brothers. So the oldest guy, they all get married in order like good uh, Jewish guys. Uh, The oldest one marries and he dies without leaving any children. And according to the Jewish law in Deuteronomy 25, he's the second brother, marries her and so on. And they don't have any kids and and keeps going. And at the end of the day, this poor woman, she's got seven dead husbands and no kids. And the Sadducees say to Jesus, well, you know, who's, you know, in the resurrection, who's, who's, uh, Whose wife is she going to be? Very interesting what Jesus says. He says, you guys are wrong. Firstly, because you don't know the scriptures. 
And secondly, because you don't know God's power. That's very telling, isn't it? Very telling. We can know the scriptures in great detail. We can, we can know how many angels can dance on the pinhead and all that kind of stuff, all this theological nitpicking that we often get into and yet miss the whole big picture of who God is and what he's doing and his power. We can be like a, a Ferrari with no petrol in the tank. You know, look really good but just go nowhere. And that's what Jesus says to these Sadducees. That's where they're so, where they're so sad, you see. They, they don't know the power of God. And Jesus says, God's the God of the living, not of the dead. And he uses the example from Exodus 3, where, where God comes to Moses in the burning bush and says, and Moses says, who are you? He says, I'm the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob, all of whom to Moses are dead. They're long gone. And Jesus says, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And the promises that he gave to those people are still being fulfilled. And he said, you guys haven't got a clue about the next life. We won't, they won't be marrying and giving in marriage in heaven. Uh, all our relationships will be perfect. We will, we'll have a different existence. He said, but you like, we, we like angels, which I think means it'll be different from here. We'll, we'll be able to recognise one another as the disciples were able to recognise Jesus, but we'll have a different body. And more than that, all our relationships will be perfect. There'll be absolutely no need for exclusive relationships. You know, all our marriage problems will be over. All those bickerings and things that we have, they'll be gone. And when not just have a... If you, if you, if you are married or would be married, you the, 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 won't just have that relationship with that person. You'll have a perfect relationship with everybody. Won't it be wonderful? Be incredible, no jealousy, nothing like that. And that's what Jesus says you've got the whole thing wrong because you don't understand the scriptures and you don't understand the power of God. And so Jesus turned the whole idea of what the future looks like on its head for these Sadducees. Secondly, he then talks to them about real religion. So far, we see people coming to Jesus who are driven by profit or justifying themselves or law-keeping um, or, or just by bloody-minded opposition to Jesus. They don't want to see anything any other way. But now in verses, uh, from verse 28, we see this scribe come along who has a genuine question. And he, I think he genuinely wants the answer. In fact, as it unfolds, it becomes really clear that he does. He's a scribe, he's a teacher of the law and he hears Jesus giving wise answers to these tricksters and trappers. So he asks his question, what's the most important law? That's a big question for these guys. That's a big question for us. What's the most important thing to be doing? The scribes had actually worked it out. They'd gone right through the, the uh, Old Testament law and they worked out there were 613 different commands. There were 365 don'ts and 248 do's. And they tried to classify them. Some of them were light, some of them were heavy, depending on the wording and depending on the punishment for not doing it and so on. And so it was a, it was a thing of debate. You can look at uh, what the different rabbis have said throughout history. It was a hot topic. But Jesus answered without hesitation from the Shema, the first part of the Old Testament law, where God says, Hear, O Israel. Hero Israel. There are two things Jesus says listen and love. They're the two most important things. Hear, O Israel, listen. The Lord your God is one. And you are to love the Lord your God with all your being, your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And you are to love your neighbour as yourself. This is where Christianity differs. Real Christianity, I mean, biblical Christianity differs. From religion, all religion, at its motivation, isn't it? What's driving us is love for God and love for our neighbour. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Love out of your heart, literally it means, from your heart, from your mind. 
from yourself, from your strength. The energy that God gives us is to be expended in love for him, love for our neighbour. Our thought life is to be driven by that. Our affections are to be driven by that. And it's a good question, isn't it? What actually captures our heart? What is it that's driving us? What is it that really drives us and pulls us? Not just in our life when we get together on a Sunday morning, but every day of our lives. Jesus says, love for God, love for others. They're the two greatest commandments. Then he gives two examples of living this way. A negative one, the scribes in verses 38 to 40, who loved position and power and recognition. They loved being greeted in the marketplace and so on. It's all self-directed. And it leads to condemnation. Jesus says, beware of them. They're going to have a great condemnation. Uh, uh, in the verses before that he talks about Jesus really being the Lord and he'll put all his enemies under his feet Jesus says steer clear of such people who are motivated by self-love by recognition by lust for power and then his positive example is of the widow uh, in the temple Jesus is sitting opposite the big collection box and the rich people are coming in and shoveling the stuff in so that they can be seen Uh, No doubt they were well in with the temple luminaries. They were on the list of the high net worth individuals who who get their private dinner with the big shots, uh, who get the the nice gold-edged letter at tax time and so on, who, who, who get the big offer, you know, if you give this much, we'll put your name on the church hall or the pulpit or whatever. And then comes this widow and all she has is two tiny coins that's how big they were two tiny copper coins and she drops them in the box and Jesus commends her because he knows her heart doesn't he 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 sees here here's a woman who loves the Lord her God with all her heart mind and soul and strength And she puts her money where her heart and mind and soul and strength is. All of it. She doesn't know where her next meal is going to come from. She doesn't have any money to buy it. She doesn't know how she's going to get her worn out shoes repaired or how her she's going to get her clothing patched. Maybe look after her children that she has total responsibility for. But she knows who she's trusting for that. She loves the Lord her God with all her heart, mind, soul and strength. And in putting that money in the box, she's saying, Lord, I trust you completely. I trust you completely. This is Jesus' example of what it means to live in that way. With all our heart, mind, soul and strength focused on love for God. And love for neighbour. Jesus commends her example to his followers. There are lots of motives on display here in this part of Mark, aren't there? Profit, power, reputation, position, opposition to Jesus. And all of these, Jesus is saying in his big parable, are they are signs of rejection of the owner. It's not about God, it's about me. And Jesus, in saying the biggest thing is love for God. Love for neighbour. He actually means that. Because in the next few days, out of his deep, deep love for God and his deep obedience to God and his endless love for his neighbour, for you and for me, he's going to give everything. He's going to go to the cross and he's going to die that death that we deserve. Greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. What's driving you? What's driving you? What's driving me? Friends, it is so easy. I know this from personal experience. I've been a Christian for a long time now. I'm sure you do if you're a Christian. It is so easy to begin by doing the right thing for the right reason. For doing what we do for God and for others out of a deep love for God. And slowly drifting into doing it out of habit, out of, well, I'm a Christian, that's what Christians do, I need to do this, out of duty. 
out of some sort of law code that you've set up for yourself and it becomes dry and arid and barren. And the the word of Jesus to the church in Laodicea comes to mind, doesn't it? Return to your first love. Return to your first love. Do the right thing for the right reason. Maybe I've given this illustration before, but I can come home and give Janet a bunch of flowers and of course she's going to say what's this for it's not my birthday or what, our anniversary what, what's this for and I can say to her look I've been reading a book about what good husbands do and in that book it said you should if you're a good husband take flowers to your wife I reckon I'd probably end up with a few rose prickles in my face um, <laughs> if that's what I said let's do a rerun I'll bring the flowers and she's what are these for and I said look I was just thinking how much I love you how much I appreciate what you the love that you show for me and I just want to say thanks that's so different isn't it and this is what Jesus is driving at friends let's examine our hearts let's see why we're doing what we're doing not just here in church but in the rest of our lives as well that it be driven by a deep love for God And that it be driven by a deep love for our neighbour. Especially our neighbours who still need to know Jesus. Let's um, bow together and ask his help. Friends, we need his help in this area. I know I do. And I'm sure you do as well. Let's just take a moment to examine our hearts. And think about what's uh, driving us. It's really hard to know what your motives are, I believe. But let's just ask God to uh, open us up to understand what's driving us in our hearts.